and welcome to Africa on the Move in partnership with DW. I am Fumi Onoa Jefi. Today, we'll be looking at citizens of the continents making small changes with big impact. We start with Ethiopia, where a young man believes that skateboarding, yes, skateboarding, can help change the attitude of young people. Let's see about that. Shiromeda, a district of the Ethiopian capital, is better known for its huge garment market than for skateboarding, but that's changing. Israel Dejene founded the Mugabe Skate Project. Mugabe is an Amharic word meaning someone who gives life to others. The main focus is to help the kids, you know, understand the wooden power, you know, the wooden strength. So I always want them to help them focus on no matter how big or small what we have, it's just like when we focus on what we have and use it for positive, that makes a big impact. Positivity is more than welcome in this neighborhood of roughly 10,000, where poverty is widespread and young people are easily lured into petty crime. Kids get involved in, you know, a group fight or like in a stealing, you know, just that, especially on the, like around the teenage years, that became a problem, they end up being in a trouble. The Mugabe Skate Project keeps the youngsters out of trouble. Israel finances most of the project himself. Skateboarding offers useful life lessons for kids. Whoever falls down learns to get right back up again. That's helping 17-year-old Lucas Ayele rethink his future. Before I started at Mugabe Skate, I was just hanging around the neighborhood, not doing much. But now I'm learning some positive values. When youth change their attitudes, people learn to trust the skateboarding community. Girls are joining in too. They get support and encouragement from Israel's sister Muluken, who campaigns for women's rights in Ethiopia. We talk about we are equal, like boy and girl, we have the same uh, potential. Usually the girls uh, stay at home and uh, uh, the family want them to, uh, to work uh, inside home, like cooking, washing dish, not more. So the project is also about sharing the burdens of everyday chores in the community. Today it's uh, make somebody happy day and uh, we are actually uh, going to help the ladies fetch their water so we just took their water jar and we are going to uh, fetch a water for them. Water is scarce in Ethiopia, especially during the dry season. Sometimes people have to stand in line for an hour until it's their turn at the tap. Bamlak Nigus, who's been with Mugabe Skate since he was 12, takes the long wait in stride. Before, I didn't care about anybody else in the community, but now I help people and I've changed. The youth of Shiromeda see Israel Dejene as a role model. He hopes to expand his skate park beyond Addis Ababa and make the sport popular all across Ethiopia. From Ethiopia, we head to South Africa, where a young lady, Tabila, is making a difference in the life of orphans with a cake. Today, Thulisele Rampora celebrates her 16th birthday. She lives in the Christ Church Christian Care Center, an orphanage in central Johannesburg. Thulisele has been looking forward to this day because every month, the care center organizes a party for all birthday boys and girls who live at the orphanage. The cake comes from 21-year-old Tabila Tabeta. One day in a month, she visits different orphanages to celebrate all birthday children of that month. With her business tea party, she also creates patisserie for paying clients. Tabila uses part of her profits for her birthday cake project. I always liked to volunteer at orphanages. Even when I was younger, I used to um, volunteer at orphanages. So what actually happened was I was looking for ways to volunteer and I Googled how to, like, different ways to volunteer and I came across um, baking birthday cakes for orphans. The baking does not only make Tabila happy, the children and the young adults also enjoy celebrating their birthdays. 
a nice feeling. It's a nice feel feeling. Welcome. You feel welcomed, appreciated, and celebrated. Birthdays are often difficult days for orphan children who lost their family. Thulasile lost her parents eight years ago. When her grandmother gave her into custody of the care center, Thulasile found a new home and family. The center took care of her education. Now, she would like to study architecture. For them, education comes first. At home, we had financial problems. They couldn't take me to school. And yeah, that's, that was a problem. And I was living with my grandmother. Yeah, and she couldn't take care of me. Tabila learned how to bake from her grandmother who inspired her. She now wants to do the same with the children at the orphanage. Recently, she started to offer baking classes where she teaches young children how to correctly bake a cake. With the baking lessons, we, we try to just make the kids have fun, but at the same time, we also want them to learn. So not only are they learning baking, but they can also learn math at the same time. So this is kind of my way of combining the two things I love. I love children and I love baking. So that's why I thought the baking would be a good idea. The 50 children that live here, many have gone through trauma, tragedy, pain, heartaches, and grief. And uh, we want to share the joy with them, with people like Tabila. When she comes, it shows that somebody from the outside actually cares for the children. And they are people that have an identity as we celebrate the birthday with them. Apart from the Christ Church Center, Tabila bakes for two more orphanages in Johannesburg. And if finances would allow, she would like to bake for more in the future. Now, Tabiso in Botswana is a social entrepreneur who sees people who are considered to be at the bottom of the pyramid as potential entrepreneurs. The Kalahari Desert in central Botswana is home to an indigenous group known as the Sun. Mm -hmm. oh. Making a fire requires not just patience, but also skilled hands and a knowledge of local shrubs and other plants. Tabiso Mashaba says this centuries-old wisdom offers these rural communities a unique opportunity. In a way, we are now about to transition to what we call the knowledge-based economy. And I think indigenous knowledge systems, because they really stem from knowledge of people and people's hands and handiwork, can really help diversify the economy of Botswana because currently we are in need of people to really enterprise and to make things for themselves and turn them into businesses that can really sustain them. The Sun have survived in this harsh environment for centuries. Nowadays, they struggle with unemployment and poverty. Many young people don't see a future here, so they've decided to look for work elsewhere. Tabiso Mashaba believes the Sun have much to offer modern society, in particular, how to make the most of meager resources. He founded this workshop in the village of Dikar with the help of an American NGO. Design and engineer students work with local residents to develop machines and products that can be used by small businesses. This is a, a maker space, which we started basically around 2015 as a concept, and now it's an actual project which the San community in Dakar meet on a day-to-day -day basis to either get basic ICT skills or to use the power tools and hand tools that, and materials that we have in the workshop to make themselves the appropriate technologies that address the livelihood challenges that they go through. Today, a group of American University students is in the workshop. Together with local residents, Shannon McCoy is working on a wheelchair designed for rugged terrain. The invention aims to make elderly people more mobile. This design is to help make this wheelchair more workable on sand. So we added these chains and gears to turn this into a hand cycle to provide more power. And we also doubled the wheels to provide more traction and surface area on the sand. The wheelchair is still in the prototype stage. Once the design is finalized, local craftsmen hope to set up businesses to upgrade already existing models. That will help the elderly and the economy. 
Instead of seeing those that are at the bottom of the pyramid as a charity case, we should see them as potential innovators and potential entrepreneurs that if supported well, can actually take the Botswana economy to the next level that is led and driven by knowledge as opposed to by mineral dependency. Together with the American NGO, Tabiso Mashaba is planning to open more maker spaces in other communities in Botswana. Our next change agent is from Kenya. He's an investigative journalist who started a program called Africa Uncensored to bring issues like corruption to the fore. Investigative journalists who question those in power often put themselves at serious risk. Yet this is the path Kenya's John Allen Namu has chosen in his quest for the truth. We've been working on a story on corruption um, to do with traffic uh, in the city and it's a collaboration again with uh, a lot of people who've been working behind the scenes giving us uh, hidden camera footage just to show how corruption perpetuates itself um, with regard to the public transport system, specifically Matatus. The privately owned Matatu minibuses are a $1 billion business and allegations have long swirled that corrupt police officers are profiting from it. The concern is that corruption has driven up transport prices. This is just one example of John Allen Namu's risky reports. I think the fear comes after the story starts to be unveiled because there are a lot of people who will be affected by it. There are a lot of people who will be exposed and these are people with means to hurt um, if not us, the people on the ground, the people who've been helping us with this footage. Namu founded Africa Uncensored eight years ago. He covers a wide range of issues on his YouTube channel, including corruption, terrorism, drug trafficking, and organized crime. His documentaries and reports have earned him recognition and respect, both locally and around the world. When, for instance, he looked into the death of a high-ranking Kenyan minister in a mysterious helicopter crash in 2012, he began receiving threats. We felt that there was an attempt to stifle the space of journalists. And personally, because I've always wanted to do this and, and tell stories that I, I have a personal input in seeing that they are important. So that's how Africa Uncensored started. John Allen Namu closely collaborates in his work with his wife, Sheena Makina, a video editor. But whenever he is out on assignment, she says she wonders whether taking such risks for the sake of transparency is worth it. A lot of stories, of course, are, you know, are dangerous. And he, he also has to be away from us a lot of the time. A couple of years back, I was doing a fairly sensitive story that actually had us leave the country. We had to go into, you know, safe house and we had to be relocated and our lives were really, we had to take the school, the kids out of school. Namu does not focus on high profile issues, but rather ones he says need to be exposed for the sake of the country. In his view, ordinary people are the ones who suffer the most from corruption. And he firmly believes each report was worth the risks he takes. It's rewarding to me personally because I feel that I'm, I'm doing something that's impactful in the long run. It might, not be, um, it might not be recognized today or even tomorrow, but in the long run I think my entire body of work will stand for something and that's what fulfills me. John Allen Namu's story about Kenya's minibus taxis sparked a lively debate after it aired. And with Kenya ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world, it's unlikely he will soon run out of work. Now, being an investigative journalist has its risk. And we are proud of Joan and his wife who have risked their lives. We wish them all the best. Next on our list is Habzat Lawau, an activist helping a small village fight lead poisoning. Residents in the village of Shakira are trying to put the past behind them. In May 2015, more than 20 children here died of lead poisoning after drinking contaminated water. 
We took my son to the hospital and they told us he had been exposed to lead. He later died. We are now very careful. We hope we'll be able to protect ourselves better in the future. The government promised to help the villagers. It said it would build a new health center and provide fresh, uncontaminated drinking water. But people here fear that the funds will end up lining someone's pocket. Luckily, the residents of Shakira have a champion here, a few hundred kilometers away in Abuja. Activist Hamza Laval is committed to fighting corruption in Nigeria. His initiative, called Follow the Money, monitors government spending and finds out where the money really goes. It then publishes its findings. Laval is traveling to Shakira. For him, this visit is about more than just cleaning up the water. How can we ensure that we can still keep that momentum going beyond just environmental cleanup and uh, uh, access to health care services? The activist arrives to see things for himself. Most families in Shakira make their living from gold mining. Young people dig deep holes in the ground, hoping to strike gold. They then crush the ore to extract the precious mineral. But the ore also contains lead, which is ground into dust. The toxic particles eventually find their way into the water supply. The miners and their families are slowly being poisoned. The government is turning a blind eye to the root causes, despite its promises to help. We are shot interview with our mobile phones uh, and also taking pictures of them and, and sharing this information on Twitter and Facebook and calling them to action and showing them this evidence-based uh, uh, data. The government has kept its promise to build a new health center. It was built after the number of lead poisoning cases began to grow and more children began to die. It means that finally, lives can be saved. My child began to convulse. I've been bringing her here regularly for treatment and now she's doing better. Hamzat Laval is monitoring the whole process. Although gold diggers are still working the lead-contaminated earth, he's happy about the health center. You can see family members coming to access health care services for their children under five years who, have been, who were contaminated by lead poisoning and now receiving treatment and feeling much better. It's quite exciting for us. Although little has been done to provide alternative means of employment, the government says it will try to regulate gold mining operations in Shakira. Anti-corruption activists say they'll make sure that doesn't remain an empty promise. And today, we end the show with another activist, Pupa Fumba, in South Africa, who believes that citizens have the right to know and protest democratic processes. For months, activist Pupa Fumba has demonstrated against plans to build new nuclear power plants in South Africa. The government was planning to invest an estimated 70 billion euros in the plants, but the Cape Town High Court ruled that the plans were unlawful. The decision-making process didn't comply with constitutional standards. A victory for Pupa and his fellow activists from the Right to Know campaign. They want the government to rethink its priorities and invest in more pressing issues like supporting underprivileged communities. We hear in solidarity and also we say that away with nuclear deal and then it is not going to compensate the issues that we are face up with, such as water issues, access to patronise of sanitation, access to, to housing and patronise equality of education. Pupa heads to the Right to Know office. The group is one of South Africa's most active civil society movements. Pupa has been involved since it started in 2010. He and fellow activist Noma Mabayo discuss protest action and how to publicize the importance of democratic decision making. The internet and social media may be the most popular ways of spreading information nowadays, but Pupa and his team rely on workshops and pamphlets. There's not much access to Google in poorer communities, says Norma. South Africa is a very democratic country on paper, but when it comes to reality, 
people still demand meaningful engagement. The access to information is still not there. Freedom of expression, expression in terms of accessing through media is still not there. In 2010, the South African government tried to pass the Secrecy Bill, which would allow government officials to withhold information from the public without giving reasons. Thousands gathered before the parliament in Cape Town to demonstrate against it. The Right to Know campaign was born. Even though the bill did get passed in 2013, it's not yet been signed into law. The campaign has some prominent supporters. In August 2010, I signed on to the Right to Know campaign because as South Africans, we have fought so long for an open and democratic society. Pupa is determined to fight for democracy. A day after the protest march, he hands out flyers in Cape Town's city centre on the hazards of nuclear energy. He's keen to prepare the ground for protests against future nuclear plans. Pupa is unfazed by any form of rejection. Growing up under apartheid and in a politically active family didn't leave him with much choice, he says. The family that I grew up with, I've never been allowed a space whereby I can, I cannot be an activist. So you become an activist because you are non-political affiliate, you know, and the issues that you speak on are human rights issues. Pupa volunteers full time for Right to Know, aiming for a truly democratic South Africa. And that's all in Africa on the move this week. Ensure you're making your own small impact that will create a ripple effect of change. Have a good week.